All right, guys, welcome back to the rhythm section brought to you by the Mind Refinery. I'm Kyle Bodanis. This week, Coburn and I are taking a look at new music by Slow Tie and JPEG Mafia, as well as our first look at Taylor Swift's newly re recorded version of her classic 2008 debut, Fearless, with Taylor's version of Love Story. If you like what you hear, rate, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and if you have time, follow the Mind Refinery on social media. And now, here's the show. All right, today we're going to be talking a little new music uh, from the last few weeks. We're going to get into Taylor's version of Love Story, new stuff from JPEG Mafia, and Slow Tie. And to do this, as always, is the incomparable Coburn Blair. Coburn, how are you? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I actually really enjoyed kind of listening to all of this, you know, get, getting ready to talk about it. Yeah, it's been our first time getting into new music in a little bit, eh? I feel like we're getting over, you know, there was a lull with like notable releases for a bit. I mean, when did the Playboy Cardi album drop? Was that in? That was December 25th. That was December. Day, yeah, sure. dro- dropped Christmas. So like we really didn't get too much notable stuff after that. So I want to start with Slow Tie's new album, Tyron. Slow Tie is kind of an interesting figure. You know, he's become a go-to artist for features. You know, his work's been really solid. For you, where does Slow Tie fit in the UK music scene? I'd say Slow Tie is definitely, you know, in the new kind of class of artists coming up out of the UK. I think, too, it's interesting to me because Slow Tie definitely fits in in the UK scene. But I would say he's much more international at this point. Like, he's doing things, you know, compared to, to some artists that are, like, on a somewhat higher trajectory. He has kind of already made those international connections in terms of collaborations. And I think his style lends itself um in a way that it's a little bit more loved and a little bit more accessible to music critics um in that it finds its place within the framework of UK hip hop but you know he's pulling from grime he's pulling from you know punk he is you know experimenting and working with artists in such a way that he's kind of already an internet darling in the way that I think some UK artists don't really get that same kind of criticism or, you know, they're not really placed there. So I think that is an interesting thing for for him. I really kind of enjoy how, you know, the openness in working, you know, in, you know, across genres, you know, you know, he's showing up, you know, in some of the more storied uh, U.S. hip hop artists, uh, you know, for features. Uh, He works with Slaves a lot uh, or has previously, uh, you know, which is a UK punk band. And, you know, it, it kind of really fits. And I, I think his ability to kind of do that and work in different spaces and, uh, you know, kind of blend in to uh, which, you know, where he's working and in the, the modes he's working in is, is, has been really good. And that's kind of like how I got into him at first. I mean, like, again, like one of my favorite albums from last year uh, was uh, the Gorillaz album and uh, his track on it, Momentary Bliss, was fantastic. Um but I want to talk about, like, what were your initial thoughts on this new album? So I really like this new album. Uh, Slow Tie has been someone I've kind of checked for in the past. I haven't really spent a lot of time with his music. So this was kind of my first foray into, you know, checking out all the visuals, listening to the album back to front uh, numerous times. I really really was pulled in by you know what he was working with here i got a lot of echoes of dizzy rascal it connected with me to a lot of the grime stuff that i you know was raised on so i really enjoyed it for that i like the way that he kind of spaced this album out with a double disc i also think that he did really well at you know the use of features we have like skepta and asap you know in the first three songs and then there's a, a really big breathing period from you know track three on the first disc to track seven and then you know track one and two on on disc two and then we get into dominic fike and denzel curry um and then uh there's another feature you know deb never on track four but you know we ended it off with james blake and mount kimball and i think he really gave himself a lot of room to breathe and a lot of room to work while also incorporating features really well what's your favorite feature on this there i mean there's some good stuff to mill from uh, I think I keep coming back to Feel Away with James Blake. I really like what Dominic Fike does on terms. It really reminds me of, of uh, Six Lack or, or Black. 
there with his vo- vocal in- inclination. But yeah, I think those two, you know, stayed with me the most. I also like the video work. I think the video work kind of elevated this album into a whole nother level for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Skepta on, you know, Skepta Uncancelled, I mean, I, I, was a really, really good feature. He's, I mean, solid in general. He's like an international go-to uh, guy for features in addition to putting, you know, pretty fucking awesome albums out. Uh, ASAP Rocky was really good too. In fact, that three song opening, 45 Smoke, Cancelled, and Mazza were ju- like really good. And I just kind of really enjoyed, you know, the beats are really great. It's the bass is super deep. I mean, you hear the grime and drill roots. You know, the opening track, 45 Smoke, is super sick. You know, it sets the tone for what what we're about to kind of, like, get next. Driving, pulsating. And, like, this album is kind of what I like about UK hip-hop. It takes things like trap and drill and just, like, triples down on them. You know, and if you're kind of looking for this sonic palette... Uh, you know, an album that sounds like this, you really have to go to the UK for it. You know what I mean? You know, and it, it's really good. The James Blake cover, you know, the James Blake v- vocals are really, really good. Again, Denzel Curry, I'm always down for Denzel Curry. I just, in general, you know, thought this album was good from start to finish, to be honest with you. There's not a whole lot of skipping around happening or trying to avoid tracks. Like, just from top to bottom, I thought this was a pretty solid effort. Well, I think, too, like, you know, coming in at 35 minutes, which is, you know, shorter than this podcast, is an interesting way to make an album. And, like, I I didn't feel like it was short really listening to it, but, like, looking at the time on it after, I was kind of surprised by it. But, you know, the album has a lot to offer in that, you know, short time period. It kind of, like, it, it, it feels complete. Like, I think shorter albums... You know, there is the argument they leave you wanting more, which is good, but also, you know, they leave you, you know, wanting more in a bad, you know, in a bad way where it feels incomplete or not like a complete thought. But this doesn't kind of have that issue. It's interesting because I feel like I grew up listening to albums that were all like 80 minutes. You know what I mean? And now short albums are almost the uh, the way things go, you know? I wonder, too, if having access to albums on dsps changes the way that you feel because would you feel slighted if you bought an album that was you know this short for you know the 12.99 or 14.99 price compared to you know buying like an 80 minute album for that same price point absolutely it's funny because i we didn't even know we didn't even think in terms of content before but it's been hardwired in our brain you know in relation to price for a long time so yeah i would absolutely th- I, I think definitely that is one thing that is good about you know the dsps is that it leaves it, it's a little bit more options for what a release looks like and you know frequency of release and that kind of thing well i, I wonder if what we get these days with these deluxe and bonus albums if labels and artists are kind of holding on to that work and they know it's going to come out on the bonus album so they don't include it in, on the formal release if we would just see the, that kind of uh extras included on formal release more often because i feel like that kind of makes sense right it's like you're giving you you have that material anyways you know it's coming in two weeks or three weeks you know if you're going to take it to uh the stores or you know physical copies like just put it all together and then you know that's an album i mean i don't know if there's a big difference on that front realistically other than like the way it gets released because I mean, whether it was like bands in the 60s or in 70s or, you know, and to hip hop artists today and such is that like, you know, there was these famed sessions that produced large amounts of music. You know what I mean? Whether it's like Kanye West in Wyoming or like Led Zeppelin at Headley Grange, where there is a lot of music that comes from it. And those that music drips into other albums and such. So I think that now it just the only, the big difference is it's affecting the way it's put it. So whether they're calling it a bonus album or whether they're calling it or whether or not they're saving something to just put out a single in between albums. Um, I mean, you see that with Drake, you'll just throw a single out, that kind of thing. And I think what happens is it completely changes the way the music is curated from the recording studio. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that uh, that lends in. So what do you think about the political themes that he explores on this album? I, I, well, I mean, I, he's had me since, you know, the Mercury Prize award show where he had like a prosthetic head of fucking Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, which was 
I mean, that was controversial. I thought it was spot on. I uh, stood up and applauded. Um, I really like it because, um, I mean, we're going to get into like talking about some of the ideas of, um, men you know, mental illness and like mental health on this. And what I like about it is that, I mean, we talk about punk. It's a ve he's very punk in the way he kind of puts his things across where he ta he paints a picture of modern Britain and how that like correlates to mental health and his mental health. I, I really, really, really like it because at the end of the day, I think that UK hip hop artists are probably the best in the hip hop community at attacking the political side of, you know, their existence and how it affects them. I know that there's American artists who, you know, are definitely political. I mean, run the jewels, keep, you can name them, but with the UK, I feel like it is, there is something in their musical tradition that is always linked to the economics of England, if that makes sense. And I mean, obviously American hip hop too, but I think for the English, it's in music in general, it, it's, it's a little more like in your face, if you will. I wonder if that like kind of treads back to the way that politics is handled in Britain in large, because like the way that, you know, it's tackled by, you know, the pundits and the way that it is tackled by comedians. I think there is an, a different ease of access to talking about politics that is a little bit shied away from in the American lexicon because of just the way that it's handled and the way that politics is treated, I think, with different kind of gloves than it is in the UK. Like, I also wonder, too, if you know, slow tie being from North, uh, was he from Northampton? Yeah. If that kind of has an effect on, you know, his, cause he's, he's referencing like Margaret Th Thatcher and a lot of different things, you know, throughout his career. And I wonder if that his positionality in where he's from has, uh, has an effect on that as well. Has there been, I'm trying to think of like, other than like maybe Ronald Reagan, which political figure has contributed most to popular music? just through their shittiness and margaret thatcher definitely is like comes up in that respect yeah she's got to be top top three in that as well for sure yeah i mean thatcher's england i mean they're uh, to an extent they're still doing it i mean like even new labor under tony blair i mean there was like blatant like neoliberal economics and that affecting people and um you know and P and it being a false dawn in comparison to you know years and years of like conservative rule and i think that you know you're just seeing this in the music right now and i mean at the end of the day you know a lot of this music is from you know council estates in places like northampton and you know london and a lot of that is linked to what it is and i mean that's the big connection between uk hip-hop and american hip-hop and it's kind of the through line we talked about kid cuddy not too long ago and how his album was like a lot about inner space and mental health um this album has the same idea of it obviously um tied to the political ideas as well and how they affect mental health like how do you feel slow tie deals with these themes rather than someone like kid cuddy well, I think that's an interesting question, too, because I think you have to go back to the NME Awards uh, last year because this album came out, you know, a year apart from the NME Awards fiasco. And I think he went through kind of a soul searching thing after that. You know, he was called out on the Internet. I think canceled is a response to that. I think he is questioning, you know, what happened that night. He's, you know, referencing the drink throwing on the on the album as well. So I think he's kind of done some soul searching and some going into his own head and thinking about what happened on that point and, you know, where he's at, but also kind of relating it to, you know, what's going on in the country on tracks like NHS, ADHD. He's reflecting, you know, I think the second half does a pretty good job at kind of like going in, into those things. And I think he is... He's a super int int introspective artist, and I think we're getting that even on these short songs. He's finding a way to reflect on, you know, the larger society kind of pieces and also a very narrow focus of what's going on in his own head. I like that this is how that is manifested in his music. I like, I really like his approach because the music still has menace at times as well. So it feels like it's really a deep dive into his like sometimes maladjusted mindset and look inside. And like, he's kind of unabashed about being maladjusted. Sometimes, you know, his music has always kind of been politically motivated, but as I said earlier, the way it all kind of comes together and 
like how like how that pressure manifests itself and i feel like when we listened to cuddy and we discovered so much you know about you know well we talked about man on the moon and like how we don't really like kid cuddy uh there is something you know super self-indulgent about how he tackles things like it's kind of grandiose and over the top and he's not a person defined by subtleties whereas slow tie has an over the top style by nature but a lot of that is in crafting his persona and like and a character almost and how the idea of mental health is tied into that into that person and um you know he links those ideas to political ideas he's expressing and there's a synthesis with them all and it really kind of creates this place about how there's a kind of symbiosis between how mental health is and how society is but i i there's something more authentic about this than man on the moon 3 i think it's just coming from a different place and i think that ty has a different way of expressing it i think that for me uh, when it comes to Kid Cudi, I never really connected with the way that he he expresses his kind of um, journey, mental health journey. And I think a lot of people are able to pull something from that. But I think the way that uh, Slow Tide does here speaks to me a bit more. It's a bit more thought out for me. And it's a little bit more easy to pick up on the cues that he is trying to present. It's just generally more upfront. I, although we got to get going though. I want to move on to uh, JPEG Mafia's new album. Uh, sorry, not album. Well, it's an EP. Uh, EP, EP two. two. Yes. JPEG Mafia, another kind of interesting figure. And I'm kind of looking like trying to think where does he fit in the culture in terms of his, what he does, his output, his experimentalism, comparisons to things like Death Grips. Like, what's your thoughts on that? So I think that JPEG, you know, embodies this alternative genre. But I think also you look at, like, I think, like, when I think of JPEG, I think of, like, the festival circuit. I think of people opening up to new and weird experimental stuff. You know, he gets the death death grip comparisons to his industrialness. But I think JPEG kind of takes it different places. He's doing a lot more singing. And also, he's very in your face with it. Like, when he had those death grip comparisons he kind of made songs that parodied that and he really like just reflected on it in the open which i think is a very interesting thing to do so i think jpeg mafia is kind of he inhabits this interesting space within hip-hop where it's super experimental and it's not quite for everybody but for the people who like it they'll really get in and really dig into it and i see um big parallels uh, with him and the way that music is moving right now. I mean, one of the things that I really noticed with the last two EPs, uh, there seems to be more of a concerted effort to craft like a mainstream sound where like veteran, I think warrants the depth death grips comparisons. You know, you can see them kind of plain as day. It's super experimental and it's taking what was done on black Ben Carson, which is an objectively amazing title and uh, he just ran with it. I mean, if you listen to interviews with him, he's, he was kind of looking for this conduit of weirdness, you know, into music. Whereas then he moves into All My Heroes Are Cornballs. And there's these, like, more mainstream moments on it, mainstream, quote-unquote, with, like, that experimentalism kind of worked within it. First of all, what are your thoughts on this album? So I thought this album was really interesting because, again, it's another really short album. Of course, it's EP number two. I think that, like, the last time we looked at an album this short was Denzel Curry's album with Kenny Beats last year. So I really like what he does with this album. I like there's a lot of politics that he's talking about on here. Like, he is a veteran. He was, you know, in the the U.S. Um, armed forces. So I think that, like him kind of addressing these things he's you know talking to people on the alt-right he's mentioning trump he has skits alluding to his veteran status he mentions biden he really addresses a lot on this album he's giving us singing i think it was really good really palatable i can see what you're saying with the accessible sound but i'm wondering too is like you know hyper pop has become a huge genre right now you have people like hundred jacks and and you know other people making hyper pop songs and going viral and it's kind of taking over tiktok and all these different places so i wonder it's like this is kind of like hip-hop's reflection on that to me where it's 
not it's hip hop but it's experimental and it's not experimental for the sake of being experimental it's, exper- it's experimental because it wants to be mm-hmm. you know I'm called back to things like you know bands like Purity Ring and stuff that kind of only could really exist and flourish in the internet age and as people were kind of online looking for stuff that was to their taste but then also opening up their tastes and just experimenting more and more and you know doing weird warps or doing weird you know playing songs in reverse or whatever these kind of little inflections were and people you know kind of caught on to it and enjoyed it so i think that he is a really good encapsulation of those kind of weird facets of the internet and i think that works in hip-hop and i think he is on a really good trajectory right now yeah, I mean, it's more Cynthia Root in R&B than his other stuff, you know, like, um, I mean, but the, I mean, the music here is really good. And like, there's a really kind of cool stuff that comes from it, like on the song Fix Yourself, like the synths are really good. It's these like splashes of keys coming in and it's really good. And I guess from my head, it almost sounds like something more something you would hear from the weekend. But then I wasn't thinking about that hyper pop kind of style it's just i feel like a departure from his other like a different direction if you will uh from like uh jpeg's earlier stuff or yeah from jpeg's yeah. earlier stuff and also like um ep1 like ep1 yeah. for me it would be like the most rooted in, in 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 the mainstream because it isn't going quite in this direction it's almost like transitional if you will yeah i can see that for sure and i think like as music continues to pull in influences from these internet subgenres that are, you know, doing things and, and, tr- and taking music to new places. Like it's a continuation of things that have always happened. You know, people are always innovating and the mainstream is slow to catch up. So I think this is a good example of somebody who's innovating and taking things in, in creative places. And I think we'll see people kind of reflect on this and pull from this eventually. So I'll ask you a couple questions. Do you think this music is more accessible than something like veteran? I would say, like, a little bit more accessible than Veteran. I would also say that, like, you have to make a Veteran to be able to do this. You have to kind of come in and, you know, show what it is that you're doing, what you're aiming for, and then people will kind of be able to follow you to to this. So I think, yes, this is more accessible than Veteran, but I don't think it's accessible on purpose. If it's not really accessible on purpose, but do you think it's more accessible is the question. I think it's slightly more accessible, but like, I mean, what is accessibility really? Like, is it like something, is it, does it something that sounds like something you've heard before? Is that make things accessible? Or no, it's is more it... conforming to the music of the day at the time it's released. So I would say, I, I don't think that, cause I don't think this is conforming really. I think it's, he's making what he wants to make and he's pulling from his influences. And I think that on this album compared to some earlier stuff, the influences might be a bit more familiar to people, but I don't think that makes it more conformance. Yeah. I don't necessarily mean the conforming in like a, in a like negative way. I guess the idea is, is, you know, how intentional is it? And is there pressure for an artist like Denzel? Like I, uh, sorry, not Denzel Curry, um, like JPEG mafia. Like, for example, I like, I think his music is really fucking good. And I think he's generally an artist who goes to the beat of his own drummer. And I think that his music is evident of that. I was just wondering, you know, is there any elements of succumbing? Like, does an artist like JPEG Mafia, you think, ever feel pressure to kind of move in a certain direction? I, I don't think I don't think so, right? Because I think that once you have, you know, kind of gotten the accolades and pushed yourself to the point that, like, someone like he, like he's at... He can kind of just do what he wants and what he feels moved by, and the fans and the audience will kind of come to him in that place, and they'll be able to pull from it, you know, what they think um, it means to them. You know, they'll be able to pull the influences that they like out of it, right? So I think that's in the same way that we're looking at here, where we can kind of hear the R and B sounds and stuff in, into it. But I, like, you know, I don't think this would do great on like what you know urban radio used to be yeah i agree with that yeah i don't think it really fits anywhere specific i think that it does have a little bit more traditional influencing in the sounds that it's pulling from but but i don't think that makes it like super 
accessible. And I, I get like what you're saying. It's not like a, a negative thing. I just don't think that like he is trying to aim there. I think he's just doing what he wants because I think that's I'm, who he's always been. And I mean, something into the direction of what you're saying. I mean, like realistically, if you looked at his like last full length and then like looked at this, it's like, would this be a predictable move? No. So then is it then it's just as experimental you know what i mean yeah. um so r then he's experimenting so i mean i definitely see what you're saying and then uh, you know there's definitely a good argument for that because it is off his beaten path as well and i do agree that it's not it doesn't have the sheen that you know some like others that i we would be saying would be more um you know mainstream contemporary would be um i always wonder this too because i'm like there's mainstream artists that i'm like He's fucking way better than me. Like, I don't like. Listen, you can at me. I don't like Little Uzi Vert. I fucking love JPEG Mafia. I don't like fucking Playboy Cardi. I love JPEG Mafia, and um, I find him infinitely more interesting than these artists. And you know, like Denzel Curry as well. I find him more interesting. Um, you know, even the Death Grips in a previous comparison. You know, there's a sense of danger and a sense of the unknown, and that's one thing I really love about JPEG Mafia's stuff because he's listen the, the the way mainstream artists and this goes to your you know your point about um you know how different internet cultures and sounds and you know like subgenres kind of inform other artists some artists are really good at keeping their ear to it and i think being an artist who isn't quite in the mainstream with mainstream responsibilities or you know or mainstream pressures um, it enables him to kind of be more, f not, f what's the word I'm looking for? Flexible with, in, you know, interpretations of sound and taking these kind of, you know, these kind of sounds and such. Yeah, I, I'm a huge Little Uzi fan. I think he what he does is really creative and really great. Um, and I think that he is good at translating certain other sounds. Like, I think he pulls from his influence as well. And I think he can do this like weird rock warp kind of tour music. Um, but I'd say in terms of like, you know, comparing artists like Denzel and like, you know, main, more mainstream acts that like fit to a wider range, it's like there, it's good that there's niches and there's room for people to operate within like, niches. You can find whatever you want for your tastes and that you could have these mainstream artists and these, um, you know, more creative and more niche artists be at the same festivals and do similar stuff, you know, maybe different sized stages, of course, but there's room for, you know, all of that. And there's audiences for all of it. Absolutely. I'm definitely like, I'm, I'm always kind of a, just because of, first of all, like wondering, I'm always a, wondering, especially with hip hop, if something is more a calculation or more a natural movement. You know what I mean? Like something that's created. So I definitely, that, I mean, at the end of the day, that's one thing that's great about, um, you know, that is one of the pauses about working, you know, especially in more of like an internet space is that you can, oh, like it's, it's so accessible, anything you're looking for. And you can just like do some Google searches, like of a sound you're looking for and figure out who, who created that and who are the contemporaries of that. And I guess my big thing is I find JPEG Mafia more exciting than those artists I name. But, you know, I, at the end of the day, I thought this album was really, really good. I mean, he puts out good stuff. It just, I guess at first, didn't feel like a JPEG Mafia album. But your points about it make me think that it might be completely a JPEG Mafia album. Yeah, I'd say, like, he is achieving new things and he's, you know, heading to different trajectories and he's like doing it you know in the, like you know uniquely himself and i think that's what makes jpeg mafia jpeg mafia that's why you know he's not going to you know be number one artist no nominated the grammys or whatever it is for the or do a super bowl halftime show because that's not where his music goes and we think he's okay with that yeah and i think that's fine perfect uh, so again, really, 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 really uh, good stuff from JPEG Mafia. I want to kind of move on to, and it's kind of been an ongoing story and drama in the music industry, obviously, the whole situation with Taylor Swift and Scooter Braun, and um, it kind of created this idea to, 
um, redo, uh, you know, some of her early albums uh, that were on her early label. What was the label called again? I can't. It was a big, big, big red... machine. Yeah, big machine. So she dropped uh, the new version, the Taylor version of Love Story. And I'm going to ask you very simply, one, can you really tell the difference between the two? And which one do you think is better? I would say it's a little bit hard to tell the difference, especially for the average fan. The versions are really extremely close. I think if you're listening as an experienced music listener, you can hear a little bit different things on the mix. There's like a, a violin that like is a little bit turned up that isn't as drowned out in the mix as the twenty uh, the original version. I think her vocal inclination is slightly warmer just from you know being more comfortable with music. She's not 18 anymore. This is you know over a decade later. I think as well. She's been performing this song for, you know, 10 plus years. Like, she's really good at performing this song. I'm sure she's done this song in, you know, however many countries there are on Earth. She's performed that somewhere. So she is comfortable with it. Like, I was expecting, you know, a little bit different. But, like, again, this isn't a cover. This is her doing her her song that she's been doing for a long time with a band that's been performing this song a long time. So I, I think I was expecting to hear some like big differences, but she's not doing a rendition of the song. She's just doing the song again. Um, So I think, you know, both versions sound great and sound fine. You know, 2018 version, you can hear a little bit of inexperience in her voice. And that's not something that like everybody could hear, but I think you can like hear the, the differences there. I don't have a version that I think sounds better. I think they're both great versions, you know, different places at, in her career there's like yeah it, it there's subtleties with the mix and just like in the timber of her voice because vocal cords strain and change and they get more unique properties you know as an artist gets older which is good i think her voice is much better than it was before she's kind of entering that sweet spot in a singer's career you know in a singer's career and in a singer's life where it just there is a there's more of a richness and uh you can hear that a bit but i mean it's pretty much spot on she just decided to re-record uh, one of her songs, and uh, she did it very well. And the fact that it's so close with, I think, just mo- uh, like um, subtle market improvements, you know, in the mix, I mean, like, do you think this is a blueprint for artists who are having master tape issues in the future? I mean, I think maybe for certain acts this might work. It'll depend on, like, what kind of deals they're in. But, like, I don't think this would work for anyone who really isn't as big as Taylor Swift. I think this is one of those things where she is at a huge level. She's one of the biggest artists, like, ever. So I don't think this works for every artist. And I don't think every artist, like, people would care necessarily to hear new versions of certain songs. Like, I would say, okay, so in framing this, I would say that, yes, I mean, it would. It, this is definitely... A situation that is only open to, you know, people who are in the pop lexicon and have followings because like big followings, especially fervent ones, because there's the the Internet component to this where if you're a Taylor Swift fan and you're like, which song, which one of these versions am I going to listen to? Because it's so close to the original, you know what I mean? And it's not like worse than the original or lacking something that the original has. It's almost like your devotion as a fan would be more towards listening to this version. Yeah, she she can just simply tweet out, listen to my new version, don't listen to my old version. And, you know, her millions and millions and millions of followers will, you know, do that exact thing. So, like, she can basically make an album obsolete. Like, you could do this as well if Rihanna got into into a situation where she had to do this again fucking Beyonce, you know, where they were getting screwed by uh, by a situation that was completely out of their control and, you know, and it really left a bad taste in their mouth. Like, those kind of artists could do that because of the loyal following they have. And, like, that's kind of why I'm like, what is the larger effect on the music industry of this idea? And if there is there even one? I think this is one of those instances is where it seems very like an artist empowering kind of technique, but I don't think it is. I think it's somewhat self-serving and not in a bad way. I think this maybe sets a good precedent for artists, you know, if they want to try and follow this blueprint, but I really think this is just a Taylor Swift thing. This is for her. And, you know, like you said, for the Beyonce's or the Rihanna's or anybody on that level who can 
kind of check those boxes and, and get people to actually care about listening to the new version. Like I'm sure, you know, her fans would delete the old version off their off their DSPs and, and get the new version. So I think if you have a backing band that's in house that you can call on at any time, if you have access to really high quality studios and engineers and producers and you've been touring a song that is a hit single that has sold, you know, multi triple platinum uh, numbers and you've played that song, you know, for the, for 10 years of your life and that you're really familiar with it, that you could do it in your sleep, then yes, go ahead and re-record anything you want. But I don't think it will work for everybody else. No, I think there is a 99.5% like of the music making population where this doesn't happen because like like for your app i mean obviously the label situations and label ownership of master tapes and all that kind of stuff and like how that business works has screwed so many artists and so many that we haven't even heard of knowing you know albums that never got released because of it so there's i mean at the end of the day not much you can do i was just very curious because this is just very an internet age thing that would be only popular during the internet age like i mean like i don't even prince i don't see doing this would be able to do it you know what i mean well i think too it's like it would be an age thing right where it's like okay did you get screwed screwed over in a time period where your voice like you know hasn't like you're not like you know i got screwed over and my catalog bought for me you know when i was 35 and now i like you know i got screwed over now i'm like whatever age and i had to re-record it like you know she got screwed over fairly recently she's still top of the chart she's still doing really well and you know th there's not a huge gap in, in her voice or, or her maturity i mean entering into the 90s i mean like prince really kind of you know overwent a change also spiritually and all this kind of stuff so like is he gonna record re-record purple rain like i don't think so i also think with some situations like the fan bases are different you know what i mean like i think there's certain artists you can only bottle the lightning once whereas this is like a little bit more you know a fairly defined pop song and like it's about like you know what i mean if, do you kind of get where i'm going with that no like, i definitely kind of get where you're going for sure so i mean we'll see more uh with the taylor swift situation as the uh album comes out and you know and and we we see how this is but i mean like it was smart on her part also i believe that a recency bias uh will affect the way new people get exposed to her too because they'll be like oh I'm going to listen to this version because the other, because it's, you know, more recent and it's more higher up on the list. I mean, like even just being higher up on, you know, the a DSP's, you know, album list. She's pretty much getting to put out a greatest hits album for no reason, like not for no reason, but for like a contrived reason. And it's going to like double her, set, her streaming numbers or like triple them. So that's kind of an amazing thing for her. Absolutely. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, Anyways, uh, Mr. Coburn Blair, we got to get going. Thank you so much again. We'll talk to you next week. Looking forward to it.